Yeah. All right. Hello, Internet. Uh, welcome to the greatest uh, Google Hangouts State Department's ever had. Uh, my name is Seamus Hughes. I'm the moderator of this discussion. Uh, we're going to be looking at how uh, youth issues intersect with countering violent extremism, uh, the role of government in this, the role that government shouldn't have, uh, the role of non-governmental actors uh, in this. And so we have an all-star lineup of people that are on this Google Hangout. We'll go for about 30 minutes uh, with a series of questions and answers and a back and forth. I've gotten a few questions from Twitter and other social media platforms. Um, let me introduce kind of so you get a sense of who the room is. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure of having three different Michaels on the Google Hangout. Michael Ortiz, he's the uh, Deputy Coordinator for Counting Violent Extremism at the State Department's uh, CT and CV Bureau. Andy Ravens, who's the Special Advisor for Global Youth Issues at the State Department. Dara Katz, who uh, works CV at USAID. Uh, Michael McCabe, the Youth Coordinator at USAID. Mike Dobbins, who's the Director for Global Affairs at the Search for Common Ground at the Search for Common Ground, and Gulala Ishmael, the chairperson and co-founder of Aware Girls. Uh, okay, so that's the, the all-star panel. Uh, and let's just jump right into it. Uh, Mike, I would wonder if you could kind of set the stage uh, of what we're talking about when we talk about youth and countering violent extremism, uh, and then we'll go from there. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks for everyone for joining today. Um, so. We're spending a lot of time at the State Department thinking about countering violent extremism. And a huge component of that is our outreach to youth. And uh, just a few weeks ago in New York, in partnership with Search for Common Ground, we hosted a very unique event. Um, we brought together youth leaders from around the world, civil society and government leaders, to talk about the many ways that the two groups could partner together um, to take on this challenge from engaging civil society and community groups to engaging in counter messaging. Youth are doing a ton of work on this and we need to ensure governments around the world are doing everything they can to empower those youth. At the same time, we need to ensure that youth uh, are at the table for the big decisions that governments are making about counterterrorism and countering violent extremism issues. So our, our panel um, is a great group of folks who are doing important works on different aspects of this approach. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the UN uh, Resolution 2250, but I think I might table that for a second and go to our um, non-governmental partners because I think they have a unique perspective uh, on this. You know, I, I'd, I'd reach out to our Search for Common Ground participants and uh, the AWARE uh, girls whether we could talk a little bit about the role of uh, youth and government and the role of non-governmental actors in this space uh, and what role you guys see you should play uh, versus what role you shouldn't play in, in this dynamic. Uh, maybe we can start with, with Maggie and Mike and then uh, Gulala. Uh, great. So thank you so much for that question. Um, and um, I'll keep my remarks brief. Uh, what I would say is that I think there needs to be a greater space for youth in uh, policymaking circles and, and not just from an implementation point of view, but from the actual policy planning point of view for those decisions that affect their lives, whether it's uh, peace processes, peace building, or if they're economic, uh, social, or, or cultural in nature. Um, and the, the greater amount of inclusion that there can be at all levels, including at the local level, um, the greater this, the kind of social cohesion uh, will be. Uh, that's what uh, I've found in a bit of research that I've done with search and in the research that I've done thus far. And I'm happy to speak more about that, but I think at this point I'll let uh, Mike say a couple of words and Gulal also. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for kicking it over to, to us uh, NGOs and civil society to, to start the conversation. Um, you know, from every bit of work that we've done with SEARCH as a conflict transformation organization, from the research that Maggie's done, but that a lot of our, our peers have done, but also the lived experiences uh, of our staff and colleagues around the world, uh, you know, the, and I think, you know, from, from many, uh, uh, young people. Ultimately, violent extremism is not a government. Is not just the government's problem. This is ultimately social. It's ultimately a social problem. It's social dynamics that lead people to violence, and government has a role, uh, both in ensuring security for the population and also in alleviating uh, some of the grievances that that drive people to participate in violence. But at the end of the day, all of this this is an all of society problem, and it needs an all of society a solution. Religious leaders, uh, community leaders, civil society, 
governments, we all have our role to play, and young people can play a particularly strong role in reaching out to their peers, but also not only driving, uh, not only preventing violent extremism, but driving some of the, the change uh, that can alleviate the, the underlying drivers. And so uh, we as civil society are particularly uh, keen to, to have that chance to raise up youth, young people's voices uh, to amplify that, but also to carry it to, to governments, because there's some things that you guys can do, there's some things that we can do, uh, and, and there are some things uh, where it is appropriate for us to work together. Okay. Uh, thank you for the um, thank you for the hangout and for having us here. Uh, when it comes to the issue of violent extremism and young people, uh, we have been working on this issue for uh, for more than 15 years. When the when even the world had not recognized the issue of violent extremism, and what we have come across now that global discussions are happening around violent extremism, that young people are seen as the problems, they are seen as the perpetrators, as these troublemakers, as a one who need to be protected or prevented only. While from our experience we have been seeing that young people have actually already been playing role of actors in peace building they have already been playing the role of uh, playing the role of actors in preventing violent extremism in the communities and therefore we were advocating for UN Security Council resolution through which the member state would actually recognize that young people are already playing positive role their roles should be recognized and they should be involved meaningfully in the peacemaking processes and by and when we uh, speaks about engaging young people in peace building processes it just don't mean that having them on table it also means making sure that young people at the grassroots level they have the resources and the platforms where they are already working in their communities as peace builders so when one of the representative is on the negotiation table or on the peace table they're actually representative of a whole youth movement in their communities great and that actually raises a, a interesting point andy can i go over to you on this you know, I was struck by, you know, you're the, you're the special advisor for global youth issues. Uh, and how do you actually, how do you make, you know, this issue of youth and, and using young people on this very kind of delicate and dis difficult issue, how do you make them not an afterthought, um, not something you just kind of invite to the party at the very end of, the, end of it, and actually make them, you know, relevant players in this conversation? No, thank, thanks, Seamus, and thanks to the group for, uh, I think this is going to be a really exciting discussion. Uh, just to kind of take things back a second, you know, Resolution Security Council Resolution 2250 was actually the result, I think, of young people across the globe coming together, governments, non-governmental actors, uh, youth themselves, and, and youth activists coming together to really push an agenda and to push the adoption of the first ever uh, UN Security Council Resolution on Youth, Peace, and Security. The process even for that, I think, is, is a nice case study in itself. That probably began, one might argue, in April of, of uh, two years ago when the Crown Prince of Jordan uh, came in for the first time ever uh, uh, held a Security Council resolution session on youth and peace building. It then led to the Amman convening in Amman Jordan under the Jordanian government, the UN, that got young people together with the NGOs, with governments, with youth activists, created the Amman Declaration. In September of that following uh, September, um, the United States government hosted a, a youth uh, with Search for Common Ground's help, a summit on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, uh, the Global Youth Summit Against Violent Extremism, that again convened young people, governments, NGOs, youth activists, and create the Youth Action Agenda, which then helped to collectively provide a blueprint that youth leaders, activists, NGOs, governments pushed forward. And then December of this past year, of 2015, uh, while the US was president of the Security Council, the Jordanian uh, representative put forth a resolution 2250 on youth peace and security, which was unanimously adopted by the, uh, the UN Security Council and became a, a, a real nice piece of, uh, of, of a success story that I think we're trying to figure out how to better implement and ensure that youth voices are raised in a much more muscular way. So I think that even the adoption of, of 2250 in itself was a testament to the power of youth activists, of governments, of NGOs coming together to actually produce some tangible concrete results in the youth space. Now the challenge going forward is how do we implement that? How do we ensure young voices are amplified? And how do we work collectively to be able to push back against extremist elements that are out there and to ensure that, that youth have a, have a seat at the table going forward? Great, thank you. This is actually not a bad transition, this idea of this high level policies. 
um, transitioning to actual actions. Um, so maybe I think I turn to our colleagues at USAID, talk a little bit about the challenges uh, in terms of implementing youth programs when it comes to counter violent extremism, and then a little bit of work of what you guys are doing um, there. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so making that transition uh, from policy in 2012, USAID implemented its youth and development uh, policy, which was one of the first bilateral policies that focused on how to engage young people as partners. So then came the challenge, so what does that look like, the change in how we have been working with young people from beneficiaries now to, to being leaders and partners on that. And through our youth power IDIQ mechanism, we've um, put forward about $440 million for cross-sectoral programming um, for countries to look at really how do they engage with partners, not just in single silos of employment or civic participation or global health, we're really looking at comprehensive strategies at the local level that will respond to some of these push and pull factors that are, are leading to that. We've also done a lot of research trying to draw some of our lessons from um, Central America, for example, on peace and security there related to gangs and have been looking at how we can draw lessons, what is applicable, applicable and what isn't. So for example, um, really looking at kind of primary, secondary and tertiary violence um, triggers and figuring out what sort of interventions we can design together with communities for a very comprehensive community-based approach. So when we look at our work in Mali or in Tunisia or in um, Nigeria or different places, we're really trying to do this early assessment of which young people are at most risk of what type of interventions. And a lot of times we're finding that um, figuring out how to better engage families as part of this process together with young people and then also looking at how do we work together between youth and security forces. For example, in Honduras, a lot of our peace and security work has been how do we make that connection between young people and police to better work together through an array of different tools that we're doing. When we look to um, Somalia, how we're working in local governance either there or in Tunisia or other places to across North Africa to really build those connections for honest dialogue between them and, and more creative ways that they feel that they can, can work together on community solutions or safe spaces. So a lot of use of what we call youth outreach centers in a number of these key spots. And I just add um, a little bit, like for instance, um, I mean, as was already mentioned before, youth really are in this, at the center of this uh, challenge. So, and we really look at them as the problem solvers as well. Um, and we, even when we start programming, we've done, for instance, youth-led assessments. So while we've done the initial sort of identification of where we might, uh, where this problem might be um, emerging, we we then go into those communities and have the youth lead the assessment for how that program should be designed. Because people in com the community overall, uh, whether it's government or non-government, youth or older. Um, the older um, uh, population, they know where the problems are and the dynamics are the best, better than, than we could coming in from the outside. And so those youth-led assessments have been incredibly valuable, not only to design uh, the interventions and facilitate uh, the work that we're doing, but also empower the youth and change one of the biggest challenges in these programs, and I think youth programs across the board is changing the perception of youth. I think that was alluded to or implied in some of the other um, interventions earlier. How do we get youth to uh, be perceived by their parents, by community leaders, as contributors, not just as quote unquote uh, troublemakers? And I think when we see youth gaining voice and youth feeling this out of state, we see a lot better outcomes not only um, in a preventing violent extremism, but uh, in more broadly in development. Great. So we, we have our first question from Twitter, uh, which I think is probably the best question to, to give to our non-governmental um, actors on this. The question comes from Heartland Alliance, uh, which is in the Midwest, but has global reach apparently. Uh, and the question is, what is currently being done to create a safer environment for youth who are trying to flee violent extremism? Uh, and maybe I can kick it over to Search uh, or uh, Girls Aware, Aware Girls and see um, you know, how do you actually create those safe spaces that uh, Michael just talked about? Um, so, um, number one, for, so um, many young people, they're working in very dangerous 
situations for countering violent extremism, but to speak about if there is any global mechanism actually to provide protection to those peace builders. And the answer is clearly no. We don't have any any global protection mechanism for those. We have seen, we have so many examples from around the world where human rights defenders and peace builders, they have been killed, they have been refused asylums, they couldn't go, they, they couldn't move out of their situation and they were killed in that situation. So there is clearly no international mechanism at this point to protect peace builders. Number two, when we work at the community level, for example, when Aware Girls work at, works at the community level, how we make sure that young people whom we engage as partners in peace building process, how they are safe. So we do it through different mechanisms. Number one, Aware Girls has a network of young uh, peace builders. We call it Youth Peace Network. Uh, and, it, uh, and the members of these network, they get trained, their capacities build on, uh, on understanding the on understanding the narratives of violent extremism, on understanding their strategies, networking, and how they can counter it, how they can develop their counter narratives, how they can promote narratives of uh, non-violence and coexistence. These young people then work in the communities. So to make sure they're protected, number one, uh, when young people become members, they have to uh, we, we give, they either select a mentor for themselves, an elder person who act as a mentor for them. Aware girls also act as mentor for them. So they receive mentorship and they have a network of elders around themselves in the community. Uh, and number two, uh, as you know, uh, in different countries, like for example, in Pakistan, if you're associated with an NGO, you may be labeled as a CIA agent, as a Western agent, or someone who's trying to destroy the culture. So we make sure that when these young people work in the community, they work as young persons and they don't like we don't expect them to label the work we have been supporting as a wear girls work we don't expect them to put our logo we don't expect them to put banners which show the, it as a, a wear girls project so by making sure that these young people they don't label their work and they do it as a community member they are more kind of protected and uh, number third, we keep the work, our young people keep the work low profile. That is other one way to kind of be a bit safer. That's it. Thanks, and maybe I just could underscore something um, that Gulali uh, said, and, and that's, you know, I, I certainly share the, the idea, you know, the, the sentiment that young people are exposed to horrendous violence, and particularly when young people speak out uh, and try to take action uh, to prevent violence, uh, they're often hard and often some of the most vulnerable um, or, or the most easiest to, to exploit. One of the things that Gulali underscored, and it's something that we've seen a lot, is, is just the importance of mentorship and sort of the peer-to-peer -peer networks and peer support, uh, particularly with people in violence. I know uh, at the conference Michael uh, Ortiz was talking about earlier in, in New York, there was a young woman from Northeastern Nigeria talking about the role that, that young women in Madugri in Borno State, uh, at the heart of the area affected by Boko Haram, played in mobilizing and taking up collections uh, to support their, their peers, their fellow uh, girls, fellow young, young men also, they were displaced um, and fleeing, including those uh, who had been abducted or, or had been uh, uh, wives or affiliated with Boko Haram. And that kind of peer, peer support, because young people understand conflict in a different way. And they understand the, than, than their adults sometimes just, or the power holders. That peer support I can be just so important uh, in, in, in terms of, of how people adjust to, to life after violence, ensuring um, you know, the, the modicum of, of protection uh, that can be guaranteed. And if I could just actually um, uh, kind of continue what Mike was just saying, in addition to providing that peer-to-peer -peer support, those networks, that protection, um, young people are actively, uh, proactively um, setting up informal education centers actually for IDPs, and, and that's something that's come out of a lot of the work that I've done, particularly for IDPs fleeing from Boko Haram. So it's it's, it's, it's a kind of a cross-community approach and a, and, a, and a series of interventions that young people have spearheaded and launched, organized themselves, in order to take care of, of those that are fleeing violence and those that are fleeing persecution. Thank you. Yeah, I was struck by both of your examples on, on Boko Haram, and, and I think I mean, there's a reason why we're having this talk about counter kind of extremists and youth issues. Um, but Michael, I was wondering if I, if Michael Ortiz, I was wondering if I could touch a little bit on how you focused um, state um, CT and CV bureaus 
um, look on these issues um, and, and approaches youth issues in a way that doesn't securitize the conversation, that doesn't say to you, we're only worried about these issues because the average age of an ISIS recruit in the Western world is, you know, 19. Uh, and how do you actually, you know, get both young people to, to join into this and make it sustainable um, that's not just, you know, based solely on, you know, one conflict or another. And then maybe, Andy, you could jump in um, with any follow-up comments. Sure, I think in terms of our overall approach, we have learned that governments are not always the best interlocutors with you or with other, uh, with other groups. So one of the things that we have done here at the State Department is help support a number of organizations which can then um, take away from the security side of things and interact directly with youth, civil society, women, and other groups. For example, we set up an organization um, and supported it called the Strong Cities Network, which supports subnational and local leaders and allows them to engage on an online platform to share best practices. Now we simply set this up and we've let civil society, youth, women and others take it from there. And they've been able to be quite successful in setting up different exchanges um, to, to show how you can solve these problems locally. We've also helped set up um, another pu public-private private partnership fund, which supports local programming. And this organization then works with local communities around the world, particularly in Africa right now, um, and helps support their efforts. So I think um, it's something that we're always aware of, but I think a good way to do that is to help support these other organizations that can then um, reach out to you. And, and just to double down on uh, Deputy Ortiz's uh, thoughts, you know, no question, you, the U.S. governments and governments as a whole, maybe even NGOs, aren't always the best interlocutors for young people. You know, we know from research and from personal experiences that youth tend to be moved by people who they actually trust and connect with. So a, a big effort on our part is actually trying to understand and lift up the stories of young people who are pushing back in meaningful ways against extremism, who are pushing their own campaigns that strengthen some of the underlying push and pull factors and and broaden and, and bolster their community and country in meaningful ways. We've done this through a, a new award that the State Department gave in April for emerging young leaders that are really tackling some of the challenges around extremism. We do this by working with a host of partners, whether it be folks like Gulali, uh, Mike and Maggie from Search for Common Ground, or a host of other uh, youth activists or, or youth NGOs that are really doing amazing work uh, on the ground and trying to lift up those stories and tell uh, the, the wider audience, open up the, uh, the, the United States uh, contacts to be able to tell that story in a more meaningful and, and, and wider way. So I think lifting up uh, the, the good things that are happening and trying to get young people to see that there are a lot of, of like-minded youth out there that are doing amazing things and there are many alternative pathways and alternative options uh, in many other spaces than to go down an extremist route. Seamus, can I make um, two additional points? One is that sure. um, uh, during the United Nations speech, uh, the president mentioned a program called the Peer-to-Peer -peer Program, um, which is this unique State Department and Facebook partnership that helps support youth um, at universities around the world to push back against uh, extremist messaging. And so this is something that, this is one of those ways where we can help, the government can help mobilize youth. Another program is, is called Hacking for Diplomacy. It's a new State Department course that we've worked on with Stanford University to really empower uh, university students to get involved in diplomatic activities. And um, the, my office, the CBE office, is going to be helping the students um, think through different ways that they can um, use technology to, um, to tackle the CBE challenge. I get points for allowing you to mention other universities besides George Washington University. Uh, <laughs> joke. It doesn't translate on Google Hangout. Uh, maybe I could a little bit turn over to our US AID partners on, on this. You know, we talked a lot about these you know, discrete programs, the peer-to-peer -peer program, stronger, uh, Strong Cities, which are very fascinating um, programs. I'd, I'd be interested in, in terms of what your organization what the ask is for US AID when they go to youth, right? What, what do you hope to get out of um, interactions with um, a younger demographic? Uh, and, and what's the outcomes you want from this? Yeah, great question. Um, just to build off something that, that Michael uh, was just saying about, for example, the youth leadership initiatives that have come out of uh, the White House and supported by state and USAID, such as the Young African Leaders Initiative, 
it's really powerful to see how this broad growing network has a, a number of young people that have gained these leadership skills and they're networking around peace and security in their own communities and across the continent and then starting to connect even across um, these different programs, whether it's the Latin America, the Southeast Asia, or the Young African Leaders Initiative. So that's, that's one positive thing. The other thing is that's really interesting is how some of these networks are even getting to the level where they're developing either local level or national um, policy recommendations. So, for example, in Mali, our Think Peace Initiative um, that came out of a, a network of about 50 youth civil society organizations helped the Malian government um, create that CBE strategy, taking into account so that um, some of these policies that are developed by governments often have very divisive or derisive language um, regarding young people. And so by having young people engaged in designing some of that policy language and recommendations, we're really able to have a greater impact. In the case of Central America, the Youth Against Violence movement was a youth-led movement um, across nine countries uh, in, in that region that basically got young people through community uh, dialogues to come up with key recommendations on peace and security that they then presented at the national level and then to a summit of all the presidents of Central America. So there are ways that young people are finding um, a space at the table, but that's where we really are trying to, to support both from the youth-led organization side, the CSO side, and the government side, how do we facilitate those dialogues as well? Yeah, and I think just to add, I think the, we don't necessarily have an ask for youth. I think it's a recognition that has been somewhat missing and that issues like violent extremism help bring to the fore, that youth are part of society and they're, they have a huge transformational role in society and that um, we need to pull them into the conversation, whether it is about development or security, and also the nexus between those two, which is what um, countering violent extremism really kind of uh, highlights is that, that important nexus. And often I think uh, because uh, when we talk about security in particular, youth are seen as, I think Mike was alluding to, more um, negative, that it is very important to pull youth in so we can uh, really, the ask is to get very effective um, and sustainable policies that help uh, advanced development and our development for that country and, to, and our goal and our ask is to really help facilitate uh, those voices to be heard to find those solutions and so I think that's why it's really you know, we go to, to youth and we have we made it we have recognized the role and created that policy as well Mike jump in yeah, if you don't if you don't mind, I just want to to come back for, for to a little bit on the securitization question. Uh, I think you know I I had the chance to talk with a young colleague from Indonesia, um, who is a 26 year old guy who's working uh, to reintegrate former uh, detainees from the prisons, who people who had been convicted of terror offenses, and helping them reintegrate um, uh, into societies to to decrease the risk of them uh, becoming recidivists. And it occurs to me that it's just so important, you know, it, security can play such a, a negative role or ne in the perceptions of how youth-led actions uh, are seen in the community. But on the other hand, the role of security uh, forces in, in listening, simply listening to young people, it's not just about sort of security, uh, the security apparatus and mirrored ministries of the interior setting the agenda, but rather listening to what people want and, and be responsive to to what people want, what young people uh, are already doing, how uh, the actions that are, that are already underway and how they can be uh, supportive. Now, I think the, the other uh, question, you know, as Mike McCabe was talking about, you know, um, uh, it, at UNGA, one of the, the comments was sort of uh, from a frustrated, uh, from a, a young person who said, you know, uh, one of the things that drives violence it's not just that there's not education, or there's not jobs, it's that people come, they ask us what we want, and they, they lock themselves in a room and decide my future. And I think that's really powerful. It's not just about asking young people what they want, but it's really through how you make sure uh, that people really have a chance uh, to, to shift their own future. And that the whole process of development, like I think Mike and Dara were talking about, is something that's really inclusive and empowering, and not just something uh, where it's uh, 
you know, just a momentary input, but really a process of, of letting people make decisions about their, their whole lives, so the whole life that they have ahead of them. Great. I, I have a couple questions coming in from Twitter, and we're running out of time, so we're going to do a little bit of a rapid fire. Um, Andy, I think this one's a quick one for you. How do I receive more information on State Department's award that Andy spoke of for youth and CBE? Terrific. The, the, uh, the, the announcement, actually, we're going to be going out very shortly for, uh, for next year's uh, nominations. The, the, the past year had been actually through our, our embassies, so embassies around the globe, our uh, consulates in, 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 uh, in, in embassies themselves had nominated different uh, young leaders. Um, and this year, I, I believe it's going to be a more uh, uh, open process we're hoping for. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be on, on the state.gov website. There's a, a section for both our education and cultural affairs um, programs. And within that, there's the Emerging Young Leaders Award and also on the Global Youth Issues portion, the Emerging Young Leaders Award. You can find out more info about last year's uh, 10 honorees and also about hopefully the application that will be coming out uh, very soon for, for the next year's class. Thanks for the Great. question. Gula, no problem. Thanks to the internet. Uh, Gula, I have a question from you um, from Twitter, which says, um, are the reintegration um, services to boys and girls differentiated uh, at all, or should they be? Uh, and how do you approach this issue? Um, yes, uh, a very important question. I think that there is the, the, there's difference in the kind of services provided to boys and girls, and it depends on culture, on which cultural context the services are being provided. For example, the culture from which I came, and I think it's also a global phenomenon that when it comes to peace building or violent extremism, it's often seen as a men's issue. It seems that it's men's who, are, who it's young men who are getting affected, it's young men who are getting and joining them. But in fact, if you look at the ground level, you will see that it's not just young men who are involved in the whole issue. It's young women as well who are involved both as actors in, in the conflict both as actors in the peace building process and therefore when it comes to integration services gender sensitive approaches are needed which addresses the issues of young women differently than boys for example uh, we have been engaging when we work we have been engaging uh, young women in madrasas we have been engaging with them in the in these religious schools we have been engaging them in dialogue so that they can speak about what peace means to them and they can make their own strategies in times like for example in our culture we need to provide safe spaces for young women where they can come where they can speak about how the conflict is affecting them and how what kind of uh, peace building initiatives they would like to lead in their community so i think it's very important important not just for integration services but also when it comes to peace building processes to have safe platforms for young women where they can speak and where they can make their own strategies and we have been doing it like this year we are uh, establishing a young woman peace uh, young woman peace network in pakistan and in this network we will have young women from the conflict affected zones they will come they will develop their own um, citizens they will develop their own charter of demand like a policy paper uh, through which they will be advocating with the national government on what they need for making peaceful society what is their demand from the government to make sure that uh, we have more peaceful and fairer societies. Great, thank you, Maggie. Do you want to jump in on anything? Uh, the only thing I would I would mention is um, is just the importance of the of the gender dimension, and that when the CBE space is is opened up for young people to weigh in and be consulted on policy as well as implementation, it will be very important. Or it is important that young uh, men and young women are consulted across a whole host of kind of interventions from kind of the educa education and sports angle, as well as the, the rehabilitation reintegration angle. Um, hey, I appreciate that. It looks like we're hitting up against our, our time. Um, we have 32 people watching us right now, which I think is a new record for us, and 12 thumbs up, uh, and only two people thumbs down. So not bad for the internet. Um, Michael Ortiz, I'd like to kick it to you if you had any, any final remarks, um, and then uh, we'll go from there. Sure, I'd just say, as we've heard today, um, there are a number of big issues that drive folks to violent extremism. It can be economic issues, education, um, governance, human rights issues, but what we've heard today is that it's really these localized drivers um, that push people to violent extremism and youth can play an absolutely critical role in helping us and helping their own governments to identify what those drivers are and then developing programs, 
um, or workshops or whatever to help take those on. So I think we need to we need to recognize that this is something that happens at the local level and continue to empower governments as well as um, youth and civil society and others to take it on themselves. But thanks everyone for joining. Great. Thanks so much. So listen, the the video will be posted on uh, State Department's Google website. Uh, we now have 15 thumbs up. So in, in the whatever you said, Michael, it worked. Um, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the the team and, and the panel for um, their insights. I would also note that most of these individuals are on Twitter and are on, on social media. So if you have follow-up questions, um, feel free to reach out to them. Uh, and so on behalf of George Washington University's program on extremism, uh, I really appreciate everyone taking the time um, to come today. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for watching. Take care.